thank you for joining us for another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, that's the show that uh, deals with uh, deals with living and working in condominiums. And we hope that this uh, this uh, YouTube uh, provides you with some information that helps you in, in those areas. You know, we're going to be talking about the legislature. And my guest today is uh, Raylene Tenno, who is uh, the program's uh, director for uh, HCCA. Hi, Raylene. Hi, Jane. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hey, you know, the legislature opened up yesterday. It was quite a ceremony. I mean, after three years, I mean, there were lots of people down at the legislature. Lots of balloons, imagine. lots of food. It was like it was like old times. I'm, <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you know, the old days. You know, when you, you didn't have to eat breakfast and lunch, you just went to the Capitol and spent the whole <laughs> half day there. And, I can imagine everybody's excited to get out of their house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was quite a it was quite exciting, you know. And hopefully, uh, and now this year they're going to. I don't know if they're going to do hybrid, but I think they're doing in person hearings. I don't know if they're going to continue with the uh, uh online i mean i heard that some people were doing hybrid hearings you know in person plus the zoom so but anyway uh there's lots of activity going on and in the last couple of days you know i've been working with some of the legislators you know about different bills i don't know what's out there but i i kind of sort of know but you know what let's talk about you know the 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 elephant in the room um benchmarking so benchmarking started for certain buildings January 2023, um, and it was signed into law last July by um, Mayor um, Blangiardi. So it it impacts the first segment impacts the buildings that have 100,000 square foot, but it's floor space. It's not just square foot of the land. It's the um, it's the floor space within the building. Um, they're not th concerned about the exterior common elements. It's only the inside. So um, when I talked with Ben Sullivan, who is the person at the city uh, for the resilience um, benchmarking, he had, oh, when I explained to him, I go, well, how do you measure the interior? So I said, okay, so if a building is like, the units are all studios, they're 300 square feet, and um, we're four floors, there's 64 units. I said, can I take, the 64, can I take the 64 units times the 300 square feet and do it that way? And he's like, well, but you got the corridors. And I said, well, what if we just measure the exterior of the building times how many floors? Because you're going to determine square footage and then times times it by the amount of floors you have. And he said that would work. Um, okay. And what is benchmarking? This is what, this is, a, this is like a software program that the management of, of your condo is supposed to download. And then um, it measures the electricity that the building uses and the water usage, right? Yes. Um, the water, they're having a few challenges, but right now it's going to start with the electric. So, um, and, the, and the water usage is only going to be building. So you're not going to need individual. So some of that information you get from the water bill that you get every month, right? But the electric is going to be for the entire building. And the whole purpose of it is to, to, to see over time how much the building is using to conserve or um, do better on their usage. You know, um, my argument back to them was, well, we have to pay the bill. So we kind of make sure we conserve as much as we can, you know, or even landscaping. Some condos have switched off to um, not so much grass maybe, um, or doing what they can to plant grass that is more drought tolerant, you know? So it's going to be a hard measure over time because I think a lot of condos, already make the effort to conserve. Um, so that's going to be interesting. But there is a, um, a software, there's a link that we can post. Um, and um, there's information, it's kind of cumbersome to set it up in the very beginning. But I'm going to be working with them, they put some tutorials together. So that I'm going to be working with trying to set up a, a mock and using their tutorial. And then I'll give them feedback of like, this doesn't make sense, it's hard. Um, but it's going to be a second read, someone that's never read it before. So I'm going to be taking it and helping them to um, kind of proofread it to see if maybe if it needs a little bit more, more help or um, adjustments in it. And then we also have our um, ACCA in-person, first one in three years, um, 
benchmarking seminar that's on February 16th. And we're going to have the city and county, the benchmarking people there to do the presentation as well. So that will be, and I've been to one before and it's kind of hard to follow. It's going to be hard to follow if we did it via the webinar. That's why I really kind of pushed to do it in person. Um, it's okay. going to be a lot easier to see it in person than it is um, via a webinar because there's the screens and going back and forth. It would be too hard. And, you know, I know that um, the first report is due in June of this year, June of 2023, which is less than six months away. Mm -hmm. And six months is really not a long time. No, it's and not. the notices have already gone out. Because right. I saw a one, right? We saw right. one of the notices. Right. So, so the city is sending notices to the buildings already. And so um, those people who are listening to this show, um, the, the, the notices will go to your property manager. And then, and then you have until June of this year to figure out how to do the benchmarking uh, so that you can submit your report. And I'm told that it's probably not real difficult. The, the, the issue is setting it up, right? Right, right? Doing the software. And once you get that all set up, then um, it's not difficult. But I and our property manager is Hawaiiana, and I'm told Hawaiiana is not going to do it. Um, and our site manager uh, says that they're not going to do it. So I told the two of them. I told the two of them at, at our board meeting. Between the two of you, somebody tell me at our next board meeting who's going to be making the report for our building. If the site manager, I mean, if the managing agent's not going to do it and the site manager's not going to do it, who is going to do it? And so I need to have an answer. And so I yeah. guess, I mean, that that's that's the dilemma is once you get your notice, who do you contact to say, okay, I got to do benchmarking. So who's going to set it up for me? I think once we get through this training, we're going to see how, how actually complex it was. Because when I first read what was going on, it said that it was for every single unit. We would have to get the report, but, I, but I'm kind of like, reading something else, I go, it's for the building as a, as a whole um, and not so much for individual units. So that's where I, there's a little bit confusion that I still need to get some clarification on, but it's supposed to be total property, not individual. Um, so I, I think once we get through the training and there, there is ability, so I'm gonna be playing with it, the software, um, I can do a mock one, I can do a makeup one. So I can actually go through the steps too. And the city also hired in Ben's office, a um, kind of like an intern. Um, her name is Marissa. So she might be the person that if someone gets stuck, that um, would be the person that we would contact. If okay, so, so the city is setting up, I mean, taking steps to make sure that there are people around. Right. In other words, if you can't do it or you have a question, then there's going to be somebody who, who, who's available, you know, right. either on the internet, uh, right. through a website or a telephone that right. is going to be able to help you. Yeah, plus they, they're making up their, their tutorial, their how-to book, so uh -huh. that will help as well. So we'll have paper copy, and if we really get stuck, then at least we have a, a point of contact. Um, but she's it, she, that's going to be her, her main focus, because okay. I'm going to be working with her when we get ready for the seminar, for the um, presentation. Okay, well, let's hope everybody, you know, comes to the seminar uh, on, what is it, February 17th, 16, right? 16th, 16th, Thursday, the 16th at Oahu Country Club. At Oahu Country Club. So those of you who are listening, tell your friends and neighbors uh, that we have a seminar on bench, uh, benchmarking and they should come out and, and join us. Let's go on to the next one. There's a ombudsman bill. I have not seen it, but a reporter contacted me, so I know it's out there or it's getting developed. And Raylene, you and I know this, the, the ombudsman bills have been raised before. They've always been shot down, mainly because we have in place with condominiums, evaluative mediation uh, that is, uh, there's money in the condo ed fund that pays for mediation. And, and I guess what I'm being told is that, you know, people either don't know or don't want to go through mediation that it's too long. They'd rather have an ombudsman. And the way the bill is set up, the DCCA real estate, you know, commission over at the you know, state of Hawaii, they're the regulatory agency that oversees condominiums. And so they would be charged, if the bill passes, an ombudsman would be set up in the DCCA. 
And because the condo, the condos have that condo ed fund that is earmarked for dispute resolution, the money will come from that fund. So the state can't say, oh, we don't have the money to hire this person. The money is there. Right. Okay, so so they're they're gonna hire this ombudsman. And the way I hear that means that if you have you are an owner and you have a complaint against the board, I guess a, maybe the board, maybe your 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 site manager or your property manager, I don't know how broad it is, that you can make a complaint probably online, you mm -hmm. know, with the DCCA, like Rico, right? Right. Right. To the ombudsman. And the ombudsman would then be charged to do an investigation and, and actually come up with a decision, whether right. you're right or you're wrong or, you know, who's ever. And, 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 and I and, you know, my 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 thought on that is, well, it's one thing to come up with a decision. But what do you do with it? Does that mean well, you can take it to court or, uh, you know, you, 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 I mean, what can you do with it? Well, and then and then as, as I'm hearing you talking, as I go, I'm like listening. I'm like, well, it's almost kind of like DC State is going to be the mediator because <laughs> they're listening. They're you know they're going to see hear the complaint. So the owner makes the complaint. They'll probably talk to the the condo association, you know, um, and hear their side. And then what are, are they going to be the mediator? I mean, uh, you know, well, how are they going to make their decisions? Yeah. You know? But so, anyway, there's, it, it's pattern after a Virginia bill. Right. And in Virginia, that's what happens. The ombudsman there gets the complaint from the homeowner, does the investigation, and comes up with a letter ruling. And, uh, you know, once you come up with a letter ruling, I guess that if you're the owner and, and the ombudsman sides with you, I guess that's a good thing. But if the ombudsman comes back and says you're wrong, I mean, what 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 happens then? And, you know, if, and, you know, in the past... Because we had, you know, uh, subsidized mediation, you know, through the condo ad fund, I've kind of, I've always opposed these ombudsman bills. I think this year I'm going to support it. And I'm going to ask, you know, Hawaii Council uh, 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 people to support it, mainly because, and, and maybe it's just me, but, you know, these board meetings are getting hostile and some of them yeah. are getting toxic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, 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 and to me, you know, the volunteer board members don't get them there. They don't get paid anything and they don't have to be put in a situation where they're, you know, yelled at and called names and say, oh, you're corrupt or you're stealing from us. You know, this kind of stuff. They don't have to put up with that kind of conduct. Right. And so, you know, maybe if this ombudsman bill allows the owners, you know, to file their complaint to the ombudsman and let the ombudsman get involved in an investigation and make a statement. I, and it will stop some of this toxic action that I'm hearing about is happening at board meetings. I'm all for it. And it's the other side of the fence too, where if it's not really the homeowner, but it's the board acting inappropriately, not following the statutes, not doing their fiduciary duty, and it's, and it's being evidenced, you know, and the homeowners can provide that to support their complaint you know, then that would be work on the, on the owner side. So two sides, right? right. Well, and you know, to me, I think when I go to testify, I'm going to say, you know, um, I think if it, instead of making it just an owner complaining against all these entities, the managing agent, the site manager or resident manager and or the board, that any of them can complain about the other. Right. And, and the ombudsman would be the one to make the decision. And there has to be enforcement. Right. There has to be some consequence if the ombudsman finds that there's been some bad conduct. You know, I don't know what the, what do you call it, the, the enforcement or the consequences would be. But to me, a bill that says that you have an ombudsman who's going to listen and come to a decision, you know, is a non-starter because once you have the decision, what do you do with it? You know? Right. right. And, and so I, I think this year that's going to be something I'm going to support if I see it. And, you know, I am going to ask that it be mutual, that it not be just the homeowner, but everybody, you know, yeah. can make complaints against each other and have the ombudsman do the investigation, make a ruling, and maybe 
have some authority uh, to, um, you know, issue consequences. Either that or say that the ombudsman's decision can be used as a basis for a complaint, for a civil complaint, mm -hmm. right? And then that person can take that opinion and go to circuit court and say, hey, you know, I went to the ombudsman, got this decision, said that the board is bad. And so uh, I want, you know, the court to do this and that, you know? Or the ombudsman can, can require them to go through training. Yeah. You know? If they want to serve on the board. Well, even a homeowner. Even a homeowner is bad. Hey, you need to take you need to take some training to set that to learn how condominiums work. You yeah. know, you need to understand that before you start complaining. You need to understand the process before yeah. you start barking up a tree and you're not understanding. Um, like about like some people always complain about the reserves. So you need to understand how the reserves work and what they're for before you start complaining about it. You know, that could be a thing where the, both sides of the fence could go be ordered to go through training some kind right. of classes so that they understand. Um, what let's about go, yeah, let's go get on to another because yeah. you know other, otherwise we're not going to have time to get yeah. over. We've got two training bills, okay. I mean, basically, not training, but anyway, there's a bill. I've seen it, and I sent you a draft. There's a bill that's going to require property managers that service association, homeowners associations for condos, co-ops, and HOAs to be licensed and regulated by the state of Hawaii. And there's another bill that talks about board members having to be trained. All board members within one year of being uh, uh, elected or appointed to the board must have training uh, to be done by the DCCA Real Estate Commission if they want to serve on a board. So let's talk about those two. I think both of them have a lot of merit, um, but but they whoever is you know the board member should also go to at least another besides their board of director training they should at least go to like you know how we do our legislative updates you know once a year they should at least attend those because they're going to get the updates on the on the current laws you know so there should be they they should be attending those as well um, but the licensing of property managers. That's kind of um, what's happening in a, a bunch of other states across the country. Um, I think there's like eight other states that require licensing, Florida, California. Um, I know Florida specifically, if um, a property manager, manager handles $100,000 or more, they require them to be licensed. And it's theirs is pretty heavy because it's 20 hours, plus you have to pass an exam, you know? Um, but um, their complaint levels is not to the level like that. I mean, we, I mean, cause we're, we hear it all the time from everybody. Um, and it, and it prevents someone from a property manager, just hiring somebody from, you know, essentially off the street say, now you're a property manager, you know, just like I had a conversation about a resident manager, you hire somebody with no experience. And now they're a manager. How can you manage if you, if you don't know your job, how can you be? Right. And especially with the Florida collapse, and yeah. the fact that, you know, now people are finding out that, you know, you have volunteer boards who basically, you know, make decisions about the operations of these multi-million dollar condo mm -hmm. co-op and HOA projects, right? right? They're volunteer boards. They're not trained engineers. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're not financial uh, wizards. And yet they have to make these complicated financial and, you know, technical decisions you know with and, and some of them and you know the, the the thing that we see a lot is with this volunteer board they do not want to spend money for consultants or for professionals right they want to go cheap right because they don't want to raise maintenance fees and you know th that's another reason for the board training is because you have these board members who have a mindset that their whole Function on um, being on the board is to keep maintenance fees low, which is very, which is not why they're there. Right, they're there to make sure that the building, that the project that you know they're supposed to be uh, overseeing, is you know is well maintained for current owners and for future owners, and that means that you have to have a healthy reserve, and that you have to do uh, periodic inspections. You got to pay professionals to come onto the property to look at your building. Otherwise you end up with a floor. And you know, in Florida, 
the board in Florida did not have the authority, you know, to um, to implement those changes. Whereas in Hawaii, the boards do have it. And we have a very strong uh, reserve law that requires mandates that you set aside sufficient funds. And, you know, the statute talks about 50 percent funded. And although that's what the statutory requirements are, I'm hearing from reserve specialists that very few buildings are 50 percent funded. Right. Many, many aren't even at the 25 percent funding level, yeah. which is really scary. Well, and, and I think the um, the change in the law where you have to use an outside third party to do the reserves, I think this year and the next two years, maintenance fees are going to go even higher because they're going to get that surprise that they weren't properly funded. For the right. Class. And that's another uh, legislative uh, bill. They're clarifying uh, the budget and reserve section. You know, they're trying to uh, clarify certain provisions to, to, you know, to say, you know, who exactly can, I mean, last year they tried to define who was a reserve specialist who can prepare these reports. And they came out with a very general term. And uh, the drafts that I've seen uh, this year of the bill, they're trying to clarify that. as so who can do the report? What kinds of information do you are is required to have in this report? And, you know, this is all good information. I mean, good, good, good stuff to put in the bill so that the, the boards have got, you know, will have guidance as to what they have to do uh, when they're working on their reserves. Yeah, because in my opinion, that, that whoever does a reserve should be, should be somebody that's not connected with the property management company or with um, a board member, you know, because that to me is a conflict of interest. And it has to be someone totally independent um, outside of that circle to get the real, because you know what, eventually it's going to back up. You know, if you get someone that tries to say, okay, let's try to keep it down, you know, let's play around with the reserve numbers, it's eventually going to back up when yeah. you're going to have something big and major and you're going to have a special assessment. And that's right. the biggest and that's thing. That's what we're all avoid. trying to avoid is a special yeah. assessment. Great. You know, yeah. and I told someone I'd rather have a maintenance fee increase of twenty dollars versus a, a special assessment of, of even two thousand or even twenty thousand. You know, I no, I'd rather have a twenty dollar a month increase versus those four digit and five digit numbers, you know? Right. And you know, so, so, so that's what, you know, uh, some of the changes in the legislature, I mean, that's, that's what's driving these three changes, licensing of property managers, training of board members. So they know better what to do to protect their buildings and, and not feel, you know, not feel that their job is to keep maintenance fees low. I mean, to me, that sends, you know, th th this that's the wrong message. And, you know, one other thing that uh, may happen, and I haven't seen the bill, but, you know, with the insurance increases that have happen been happening, and, you know, they have that hurricane relief fund when the insurance company stops selling insurance, you know, hurricane uh, coverage. And so what there is some movement to try to get uh, a state-run fund to help associations because about what uh, about a third of the people in the state of Hawaii live in condominiums right and the high rise buildings are getting surcharged because they don't have fire sprinklers and that you're talking about most of the older buildings that were built before 1986 and we're not talking small increases like 5000 not even 10000 no. we're talking this year my my building went up $65000 and that's in excess of the 18% increase that was budgeted, you know, and that's happening all over the state. And so, and you know, what it, what it means is that someday, you know, some of us are going to have to go out to surplus lines. And that means that, you know, we're going to be paying a lot more money for insurance. And, and we don't know, you know, and at first we told, we were told this is only temporary, right? The reinsurance companies that, you know, we're funding the local insurance companies. They suffered these huge losses due to natural disasters on the mainland, like wildfires and the condo collapse in Florida. Yeah. And now this year you got the floods in California, right? So it's not going to go away. Okay. Uh, natural disasters happen and insurance has to pay for the losses. And, and so everybody across the country is being surcharged 
uh, to help subsidize the losses, so to speak. It's not because people in Hawaii are doing something bad. It's because the insurance industry, right, right. Is, is suffering losses that have to be uh, recouped. And that's why they're increasing the insurance premium to those high-rise buildings in Hawaii. And so they're talking about maybe setting up a special fund in Hawaii, like the Hurricane Relief Fund. I don't know how far that's going to go. I know that uh, uh, Representative, uh, what's her name, Della uh, Balati, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. she's against it. She's got a lot of condos in her Makiki district. You know, it, it, I'm wondering if there's something else happening at the city level, because the city approved these plants, you know, these condo building plants way back when. Um, but not all of them were built immediately. Like, remember the one that's supposed to be projected at Camp Shopping Center? Yeah. Uh, the Swap Meet area or the Swap Meet used to be? Yeah. You know, they they abandoned those plans. They changed their mind, not going to do it. But what if they go back and say, like, maybe in five years ago, well, you know, maybe now the timing's right. We want to build it again. You know, um, are, is the city and county going to have to redo it and tell them they have to they have to adjust it to current building codes? and not the code that it, when it was originally approved. And I think that's what happened in the past when some of these developments were approved today, but they weren't slated to be built till like five years from now, you know, and codes change, you know, over time. So I think that's where some, probably where the city should should take a look at that and kind of give some condos a break on somehow um, because it was through their efforts or through their, um, but I think that if, if this bill is introduced, at least it's, it'll start a discussion that yeah. this is something that that we didn't bring. The condo condo people did not bring this on themselves. Right. This, this happened, you know, outside of Hawaii, and we, the high people who live in high rise condos, are being asked to subsidize these losses to the insurance industry, and that's not only us. That's high rise people, owners who live on the mainland are asked to be being asked to subsidize it as well. And so, you know, um, you know, we've got to figure out something because, uh, you know, what, what we have, what, what we have in at least in my building, you have owners coming to the board and saying, this is your fault. <laughs> yeah. You know, the fact that, you know, the insurance goes up. I mean, it's our fault because we didn't plan on it. Well, I don't think anybody planned on it. Right, right. Right. And and so so you're gonna have a lot of you know board members, uh, board owners, you know, going to their boards and saying, How come this happened? Why didn't you stop it? Why didn't you tell us? You know? It's, it's always the first thing, like, did we anticipate climate change? You know, that's something that uh, is impacting a lot of these insurances. I mean, the, the disasters is it's the climate change, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, we've kind of run out of time. And so we, we're going to have to, well, I'm sure we're going to be talking about this during the, the session because, you know, the debates will happen and, and we can talk about the issues because we would like our listeners to become involved in the process and maybe call their legislators and tell them yay or nay on certain bills. And so it's, you know, I, I hope this, this uh, uh, show will just, you know, kind of alert people to the fact that these things are happening right now and their legislators are going to be sitting down. They're probably sitting down right now looking at draft bills and some of them dealing with the exact same issues that you and I have been talking about today. So it's it's, it's going to be time for them to pick up the phone and to call their uh, legislators and say, hey, I heard about, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, bill about licensing property managers and, you know, I want you to vote for it, you know, this kind of stuff. They're gonna, we're gonna, you know, have to, you know, get people, you know, uh, alerted so that they can participate in the process and and let their legislators know what they want. And everybody, kind of during this for the month of what January, February, check your yep. emails every day because we'll send out email blasts when we want testimony submitted in so that everybody has their own, has their input into these bills moving forward. Yeah. Well, thanks, Raylene, for you know being on the show and you know, talking about these issues, and I'm sure. We're going to be doing it, you know, through the session because we right. got, you know, at least 60 days of this. It just started yesterday. Yeah. Okay. And okay. the people who are viewing this, thank you for joining us. And uh, please uh, join us again next week for another episode of Condo Insider, the show about uh, living and working in condos. So 
Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.